Hi, I'm Jake. I make RPG supplements and videos about Pathfinder 2, or PF2. I love this system. I love PF2, no matter what they do to it. <sighs> yeah, this is going to be one of those. I wore my special shirt for this one. So, the Oracle. Why... Why did they do this? All right, so I'm going to read the updated Curse of Engulfing Flames for the Flames Oracle to tell you what it does mechanically, but also to just describe all the flavor that it has. Curse of Engulfing Flames has the traits Curse, Divine, Fire, Oracle. Fires flare noticeably, though not dangerously, in your presence. You occasionally smoke slightly, and your body is almost painfully hot to the touch. When you have the Curse-bound condition, you catch fire. Taking persistent fire damage equal to your cursed bound value, which, by the way, has a maximum of four. The flames shed light like a torch, and if you enter an environment where they should, where they could not burn, such as underwater, you simply seethe with flameless heat. The flames subside when you begin refocusing to assuage your curse, or if you fall unconscious, but they resume if your refocus activity is interrupted or when you return to consciousness. That's the entirety of the flames curse. See something missing? All the flavor. All the flavor and the intricate weird crap that used to be part of the curse. So I'm going to read you the original one now. This will take a couple minutes, but I, the comparison needs to be made. Curse of Engulfing Flames. Legacy content. You see flames and smoke wherever you look. These flames might be imagined, or they might be a preternatural glimpse of the metaphorical fires that empower the entire multiverse, but you always see them. Fires flare noticeably, though not dangerously, in your presence. You occasionally smoke slightly, and your body is almost painfully hot to the touch. First stage, Minor Curse. The smoke, heat, and crackling flames of your curse fill your vision and all your other senses. Creatures further than 30 feet are concealed from you. You can't benefit from effects that would allow you to ignore or mitigate this concealment as normal for effects for an oracular curse. Moderate curse level. So the second level. Smoke and flickering visions of flame fill your senses more completely, and harmless flickers of obscuring flames also fill your space. You are concealed from other creatures, though as the other creatures aren't cursed themselves, they can benefit from effects that would allow them to ignore or mitigate the concealed condition as normal. All other, cre all other creatures and objects are concealed from you regardless of distance. However, when casting a fire spell, you automatically succeed at the flat check for this concealed condition for targets within 30 feet. Cool. All your senses become imprecise beyond 30 feet, meaning everything past 30 feet that you'd normally be able to see is hidden from you. Granted, this sucks, but there's so much flavor. Now the major curse, which I think only happens at 11th level and pass. The flames surrounding you are no longer simply visions. An aura of fire surrounds you in a 10-foot emanation, dealing 4d6 fire damage, basic reflex save, to all other creatures in the aura at the end of each of your turns. You lose 1d6 hit points at the end of your turn each round with no save. If you have a weakness to fire, increase the number of hit points you lose by that weakness. You can suppress your aura until the start of your next turn by spending a single action, which has the concentrate trait, to diminish the flames, causing neither you nor anyone in the area to take damage, while refocusing to reduce your curse, blah 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 blah. Paizo, what the fuck did you do to the oracle? You gutted the flavor, took away some cool power, and made the, the curse almost meaningless. I mean, now it feels like you're taking persistent damage for no reason. Because there's no benefit. Like, this would turn people away from playing an oracle. Yes, it's easier to play. But why would I play an oracle and take extra damage when I could just play a cleric? Or a sorcerer with the divine bloodline? I, I don't mind mechanics getting nerfed. I don't mind rewrites to a class to make it easier to understand or easier for people to play. But don't touch my flavor. Fuck you. That's part of why I play this. Not okay with this. The oracles are just less cool now. Alright, so they get, like, a free feat. And the feats are powerful. The feats are cool for oracle. Like, they, they turned up the coolness and the usefulness on the feats. They also have four domains instead of two domains to choose from. Cool. 
it's it's not cool now. It's not fun. It's not it's not as neat and otherworldly. They took away the otherworldliness and added ease of understanding and play and a little bit more power in the feats. Bad move. All right, I'll take off my angry hat and go back to the beginning. The Oracle works mostly like it did previously. There is a typo at the beginning that I really need to point out. The spells per day doesn't match the spell repertoire. I'm going to read it so that you understand the difference. If you don't care about this prelude and you want to skip right to the mysteries, click here at this time here for mysteries right there. If you don't care about mysteries, skip to the feats at this time here. This is feats here this time, feats. If you don't care about feats or mysteries, skip to this time here because that's going to be the archetype. If you don't care about the archetype, why are you watching this video? Because that's all it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, spell repertoire. The collection of spells you can cast is called your spell repertoire. At first level, you learn two first rank divine spells of your choice and five divine cantrips of your choice. That might sound familiar to you who have played the Oracle before, because that's the way it worked pre-remaster. You choose these from common spells on the divine list or from other divine spells to which you have access, just like usual. So, let's go down to the chart. Oracle spells per day. Five cantrips. Three first rank spells. Yeah, you do get a first rank spell from your mystery. So that could be making up for that, but you also get a first rank cantrip, which would bring your total to six and three. Either way, this is wrong. I suggest just ignoring the chart, going back to the way the spell, the spells per day and the repertoire worked pre-remaster because those numbers seemed correct. So it's five and two to start with, and then you get your mystery additional spells. So we're ignoring this. It's five and two. I'll go over each mystery in a moment. First, I'm going to touch on revelation spells. These are the focus spells that an oracle gets. You no longer start with two. It's one. You get one focus point, not two. Because your curse your advancement is based on curse bound the trait, which is now tied to oracle feats. Which in a way is cool because like they're not tied directly to your spell casting, so you can use these feats aside from your spell casting. I do like that they separated that. But you start with one focus point like everybody else instead of two. Next is Oracular Curse. This is important to know because we're going to be talking about curse-bound feats and gaining curse-bound levels. Oracular Curse. As an oracle, you can tap into the pure and unmitigated divine power of creation to supplement your spellcasting via curse-bound abilities, mostly feats. These abilities grant you special benefits, but the backlash of letting this power into your mortal body manifests as an oracular curse. The more curse-bound abilities you have, the more your curse worsens, but you might gain divine benefits, even as it tightens its grip on your soul. Your oracular curse is expressed using the curse-bound condition, a unique condition that affects only oracles. Immediately after the first time you use a curse-bound ability, you become curse-bound 1. And if you use a curse-bound ability while you are already curse-bound, you increase the value of your curse-bound condition by 1 after the ability resolves. Easy. 1 plus 1 equals 2. At lower levels, you can tolerate only a modest amount of divine power, and your curse-bound condition can't increase beyond curse-bound 2. As you grow in levels, you can open yourself to even more power, and your curse-bound condition can progress to 3, and finally 4. That's at 11th level and 17th. Once saturated in divine power, your soul can't absorb any more, and so you can't use a curse-bound ability if you are already at your maximum curse-bound condition. Which matters for all the feats I'm going to talk about that have curse-bound. So, the important thing is for half the career of this character, a touch more, well no, half the career, you're going to be limited to curse-bound 2. So, let's read all the feats as though you can get a max of curse-bound 2. Your oracular curse lists the specific effects of being curse-bound, which are cumulative as your curse progresses. You remain curse-bound until you refocus, which reduces your curse-bound condition by one, in addition to restoring a focus point. Like it used to do. As your curse is a direct result of divine power, you cannot mitigate, reduce, or remove the effects of your curse or any ability with a curse-bound trait by any means other than refocusing. 
For example, if a Cursebound effect makes creatures concealed from you, you can't negate that concealed condition through a magic item or spell such as Sure Strike, though you would still benefit from the other effects of that item or spell. Likewise, Cleanse, Affliction, and similar abilities don't affect your curse at all. At first level, you gain a Cursebound Oracle feat determined by your mystery, and you can learn additional Cursebound abilities through Oracle feats. So we're skipping the basics of what you get as you go up in levels. The most important things are... Well, the most important things that are a little different is Divine Access at 11th. Your mystery offers you strange access to spells typically reserved for more conventional worshippers. Choose one deity who grants one of your mysteries granted domains. Add up to three cleric spells of your choice granted by that deity to your spell list and to your spell repertoire as soon as you can cast spells of the appropriate rank. That's right, it's no longer a feat, and you have to wait later. So this is not something you can do at early levels anymore. Reading a mystery entry. Granted spells, you automatically add the spells listed here to your spell repertoire, as described in Spell Repertoire on page 130. At first level, you gain a cantrip and a first rank spell. You learn the other spells on the list as soon as you gain the ability to cast oracle spells of that rank, and those vary. It could be third level, fourth level, fifth level, whatever. Revelation spells. You automatically gain your mystery's initial revelation spell at first level and can gain more by selecting the advanced revelation, greater revelation, and diverse mystery oracle feats. Related domains. This one's a little bit more interesting because they increase the number of domains you have access to from two to four. These are the cleric domains associated with your mystery. You gain domain spells, which you can cast as revelation spells by taking the domain acumen and domain fluency feats. Until then, the domains mean nothing. At 11th level, the divine access class feature also gives you additional slotted spells based on your domains. We just talked about that. Mystery skill. You become trained in the listed skill. A few mysteries make you trained in more than one skill. Oracle Feat. You gain this first level Oracle Feat. This is a curse bound feat, so using it aggravates your oracular curse. This is a very similar format to Sorcerers. So for beginners, it's easy to follow. And for those of us who aren't beginners, it's still easy to follow. I'm going to read just the beginning blurb of each of the mysteries and then go directly down to the bolded blocks where it talks about granted spells, revelation spells, related domains, mystery, skill, Oracle Feat, and then go directly into the curse. Ancestors, the voices of generations past speak to you and you hear their words. You might resent the constant interruption, or you might revere the spirits of those who came before. Granted spells, cantrip, guidance, first level, ill omen, second, ghostly carrier, fifth level, dreaming potential. Not bad spells. Revelation spells, initial ancestral touch, advanced ancestral defense, greater ancestral form. The same spells as before. Related domains, death, duty, family, and soul. Some of these appear in different books. Mystery Skill Society. So you get society trained for free. Oracle Feet Whispers of Weakness. I'm going to have to explain the feats later. So Whispers of Weakness generally just lets you know all the weaknesses of a specific monster. At least I can give you that. The Curse. Curse of Ancestral Meddling. The ancestral spirits you commune with haunt you and meddle with your belongings and actions, either out of a well-intentioned but ultimately detrimental attempt to assist you as punishment for your audacity in circumventing the traditional means of achieving divine power for their own amusement or a mixture of the above. When you have the curse-bound condition, you are clumsy with a value equal to your curse-bound value as the spirits of your ancestors temporarily possess you and vie for control in your mind, hindering your movements. Yay. But it's much better... Then the previous Curse of the Ancestors, in which case you had to just roll randomly to see what you're supposed to freaking do that turn. It just sucked. So few people played Ancestors. It's playable now. It doesn't do much that's interesting, but it's playable. So that is a plus. Battle. Warlike forces fill you with physical might and tactical knowledge, aiming to have you uphold the glory of combat, fight to improve the world, prepare against the necessity of conflict, or endure the inev inevitability of war. Granted spells. Cantrip, shield, first, sure strike, second, telekinetic maneuver, fourth, weapon storm. Revelation spells, initial, weapon trance, advanced, battle persistence, greater revel in retribution. Related domains, destruction, might, Protection, Zeal, Mystery Skill, Athletics, Oracular Feet, Oracle Feet, sorry, Oracular Warning. It gives your allies within 20 feet plus two to their initiative and gives them temporary hit points equal to half your level. Curse of the Mortal Warrior. 
You thrive in the thick of battle, but your mystery's sheer focus on the physical and material leaves your soul weak against the tricks of spellcraft. You smell faintly of steel and blood no matter how you try to remove or mask the scent. You appear more imposing and muscular than you actually are, and you hear the faint clash and clamor of battle in the distance at all times. Cursebound 1. Spells have an easier time wounding you. You gain weakness 2 to any damage dealt by a spell. That's manageable. Any immunity or resistances you have to spells is suppressed. That's kind of annoying. This applies only to spells, not other magical abilities. Fine. Cursebound 2. You take a minus 1 status penalty to saving throws against spells. So for the most part, that's the worst that's going to happen. But once you hit 11 level, Cursebound 3, your weakness to spells is equal to your level. Fuck. Cursebound 4, your status penalty to saving throws against spells increases to minus 2. Okay, fine. That's all for battle. Did you hear fast healing? No. Did you hear armor proficiencies? No. Did you hear weapon proficiencies? No. Battle got fucked. All right, let's go into bones. <laughs> Your mystery imparts an understanding of death and undeath and all their macabre complexity. You might have had a brush with death yourself, maybe even dying and returning to life, or carry the touch of undeath in your blood. Granted spells, cantrip, void warp, first, grim tendrils, second, false vitality, third, ghostly weapon. This sounds great. These sound like fun. It also just sounds like an aberrant or occult-themed sorcerer. Revelation spells, initial, soul siphon, advanced armor of bones, greater claim undead. Related domains, death, decay, undeath, vigil. Mystery skill, medicine. Oracle feet, nudge the scales. That one heals someone within a short radius. I mean, it's useful. It's just a feat that you take as an action to heal someone. I'll get to the specifics about it in a minute. Curse of Living Death. Your body is slowly decaying even though you are alive, and using your powers furthers this unnatural living death, making you susceptible to both void and vitality damage. You carry a touch of the grave about you, manifesting as bloodless pallor, a faint smell of earth, or deathly cold skin. Curse Bond 1. You gain weakness 2 to vitality and void damage. You can be hurt by both vitality and void damage, even if one or the other normally has no effect on you. Any immunity or resistance you have to vitality or void is suppressed. Any immunity. There's a feat later that you can take that allows you to switch your polarity so that you gain void healing, which normally makes you immune to void damage. Not if you have the curse of living death. This is just stupid. Curse bound two. You take a negative one status penalty to fortitude saves. Fine. Not that bad. Curse bound three. So at 11th level, your weakness to vitality and void damage is equal to five plus your level at 11th. So it's plus 16. Fuck. And you can't tell me no bad guys are going to use void damage. Fuck. Curse bound four. Your status penalty to fortitude saving throws increases to minus two. Also bad, but not as bad as curse bound three I don't like curse of living death anymore I don't like the bones oracle it used to be my favorite so much flavor you become undead slowly bones sticking out of your body and everything it's not even there anymore cosmos cosmos Celestial bodies, great and small, exert influence on you, giving you sublime cosmic power. Perhaps you see the glittering stars as a divine blessing, or perhaps you feel drawn to the infinitely dark spaces between. Dark Tapestry. I used to love that in Pathfinder 1. Granted spells. Cantrip. Light. First, dizzying colors. Ooh. Second, darkness. Fifth, moon frenzy. I'm sorry, those just aren't impressive. Yes, they have uses, but eh. They're not all that powerful. Revelation spells, initial, spray of stars, advanced interstellar void, greater, moonlight bridge. Cool. Related domains, darkness, moon, nothingness, and star. Mystery skill, nature, oracle feet, oracular warning. The same one that battle has that allows you to add initiative to your allies and give them temporary hit points. Curse, curse of the sky's call. Your body is drawn toward the heavens, making you lighter and less substantial than you should be. Your eyes glow with starry light, and your hair and clothing float and drift about you. When you have the Cursebound condition, you are enfeebled with a value equal to your Cursebound value, and you take a status penalty to saves and DCs against all forms of forced movement equal to your Cursebound value. That's it. There is a way to modify that with feats. But at base, that's all it does. Yeah. Flames! 
Fire lives at the center of the world, the center of the sun, and the center of civilization. You might revere this elemental force, siphon power from the elemental plane of fire, or venerate a collection of deities, blah, 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 who cares. Granted spells, cantrip, ignition. First, breathe fire. Second, blazing bolt. Third, fireball. Fire, fire, fire. Makes sense. Revelation spells, initial incendiary aura, advanced whirling flames, greater flaming fusillade. Related domains, dust, fire, star, and sun. I'm guessing dust is like themed like smoke. Mystery skill, acrobatics, oracle feat, foretell harm. Foretell harm just lets you do extra damage if you damaged an enemy. I'll, I'll get to that in detail as well. The curse, curse of engulfing flames. Fires flare noticeably, though not dangerous. I gotta say that I don't like that it says all the flavor of the previous version with none of the effects of the previous version. It's like it's lying to me. Anyway, fires flare noticeably, though not dangerously, in your presence. You occasionally smoke slightly, and your body is almost painfully hot to the touch. When you have the Curse-Bound condition, you catch fire, taking persistent fire damage equal to your Curse-Bound value. The flames shed light like a torch, and if you enter an environment where they could not burn, such as underwater, you simply seethe with flameless heat. The flames subside when you begin refocusing to assuage your curse, or if you fall unconscious, but they resume if your refocus activity is interrupted or when you return to consciousness. And I don't need to read you Curse of Engulfing Flames because I read it to you in my rant at the beginning. Life. The never-ending flow of life force within living beings is palpable to you. You might uphold the sanctity of life, or perhaps you seek to undermine it. Granted spells. Cantrip, Vitality Lash, First Soothe, Second False Vitality, Fifth Grizzly Growths. All good spells. Revelation spells. Initial Life Link, which I'm not a fan of. Advanced, Delay Affliction, Greater, Life-Giving Form. Related Domains, Death, Healing, Pain, and Soul. Mystery Skill, Medicine, Oracle, Feet, Nudge of the Scales. Just heals one target. I'll read you the details about it in a moment. But essentially, you heal a person a little bit. The Curse, Curse of Outpouring Life. Life energy flows outward from you and connects you to all living things, but you expend your vital essence to do so. Your presence comforts the ill and injured, causes scars to fade slightly, spurs new growth in plants, and otherwise infuses your surroundings with vitality. As your life force seeps outward, it becomes more difficult to keep your body functioning. Magical effects that restore hit points to you take a status penalty equal to your level, minimum one, times your curse-bound value to the number of hit points you recover. That's the curse. Are these supposed to be balanced with each other? Because... That doesn't do much. Yeah, it hinders you. Fine. But compare it to the the battle oracle. I you take extra damage from all spells and you suffer a penalty on saves against all spells? I, I mean hell, even the ancestors one, clumsy. That makes it easier to hurt you. This just makes it harder to restore your health if you happen to get injured. It's like they took away all the cool shit of the Life Oracle and made their curse just not matter. Like, come on, man. Something else about the Life Oracle. Changing your healing dice to D12s was impressive and fun. And the abilities that you were able to... It let you heal like a machine. And now it doesn't do that. And it doesn't really have a penalty either what is the point of the life oracle why wouldn't i play a cleric what's the point lore knowledge and information come freely to you you might use this lore to gain power or perhaps to understand the divine mysteries of the multiverse yes they reverse these why that's just a typo okay lore has a typo the granted spells come after the revelation spells it doesn't really matter Granted spells, cantrip, read aura, first mind link, third hypercognition, sixth never mind. Good spells. I like them. They're very useful. Revelation spells, initial brain drain, advance, access, lore, greater, dread, secret. You want to know stuff? This does it. Related domains, knowledge, magic, secrecy, truth, mystery skill, occultism, and one lore skill of your choice. Makes sense for lore. Oracle feet, whispers of weakness. You learn a creature's weakness. All weaknesses that the creature has. The curse for lore. Curse of torrential knowledge. You have a link to true divine knowledge, but your mortal mind struggles to process and act on what you know. Loose materials around you, such as dust, grains of rice, and droplets of water, slowly shift to form strange runes or faint, indecipherable writing, and you sometimes speak unintelligible truths or statements in unknown languages without realizing it. 
You take a status penalty to perception checks and will saving throws equal to your curse bound value due to the torrential distractions of unasked for knowledge flooding your mind. If you are curse bound four, you additionally can't speak, use linguistic effects, or otherwise communicate with your allies, and you are stupefied one. This does almost everything that was negative with no benefits to the curse. I'm just confused. What was the point of this? Tempest Oracle. The fury of the wind and waves pounds on your heart, whether your power flows from natural storms, a conduit to the elemental planes of air and water, or who cares. Granted spells, cantrip, electric arc, first thunderstrike, fourth hydraulic torrent, sixth chain lightning. Great. Storm-themed lightning spells. Good. And other elemental water spells. Revelation spells, initial tempest touch, advanced thunderburst, greater tempest form. All useful spells, related domains, air, cold, lightning, water. Mystery skill, nature, oracle feat, foretell harm. It's the one that lets you do a little bit of extra damage after you've damaged someone. Curse of Inclement Headwinds. The least terrifyingly named curse. Oh, it's blowing on me. The weather seems to always oppose you in ways large and small. Even when you are calm and at rest, your hair and clothing are inconveniently blown about by gentle winds. You are slightly damp from the faintest drizzle, and your touch often comes with a static shock. When you have the Cursebound condition, you are opposed by the elements with the following effects. Cursebound 1. Lightning is drawn to you. You gain electricity weakness 2, and electricity spells or effects that have additional effects for a creature wearing or holding metal treat you as though you were wearing metal. Any immunity or resistance you have to such spells and effects is suppressed. I mean, that sucks, obviously. Cursebound 2. Blowing winds impose a minus 2 circumstance penalty to ranged attack rolls you make. <laughs> Cursebound 3. Your weakness to electricity is equal to 5 plus your level. God, I hate those. Cursebound 4. The raging winds push you back, imposing a 10-foot status penalty to all your speeds. I like the wind being around you and deafening people. Yes, it was hindering, but it was fun to work around. Limitations make things more interesting. And it doesn't have the limitations anymore. It's just shitty for you. It just sucks. It's just penalties. All right. The main reason most of you are here and the main thing that makes the Oracle interesting in this book, in Player Core 2. New feats. If you're looking at the screen, it's all of them that are highlighted. All right. There are a lot of these. Bear with me. Foretell Harm. It's a free action. Frequency once per round. It's curse bound. Requirements. Your previous action was to cast a non-cantrip spell that dealt damage. Your magic echoes ominously as you glimpse injury in the target's future. At the beginning of your target's next turn, it takes damage equal to twice the triggering spell's rank as a seemingly random and minor misfortune finds it. The damage and type of misfortune is of a type matching the spell. For instance, if you dealt fire damage, a flame might spawn Spontaneously ignite on them, or they might burn a hand on their torch. The target is then temporarily immune to foretell harm for 24 hours. So this isn't just like adding extra damage to your spells. It's useful once on each creature, and until level 11, it's useful twice until you refocus. It's a free action, so it's just free damage. So like at low levels, this is quite useful. To end a fight faster. To save your ass. To kill an extra goblin or something. But it quickly gets outpaced. Next new feat. Nudge the scales. One action. Curse bound. You lay a finger on the scales of life and death to heal a creature regardless of whether it's living or undead. You restore hit points equal to two plus double your level to one creature within 30 feet. That's neat. That's very neat. In addition, you can mediate, it says mediate, it's supposed to be meditate. In addition, you can meditate during your daily preparations to place yourself on one side of the scales. Choose life or death. If you align yourself with life, you are healed by vitality healing effects as normal for most living creatures. If you align yourself with death, you gain the void healing ability, causing you to be healed by void effects that restore hit points and any other effects that restore hit points to undead creatures. This is interesting for characters that start off as like a dom here. But for some reason, they want to switch off to healing or somebody who is just a normal character who wants to be immune to void damage. That's cool. 
All right, next new feat, oracular warning. Also curse bound. Still level one. Trigger, you are about to roll initiative. You have a premonition about impending danger that you use to warn your allies. Each ally within 20 feet gains a plus two status bonus to their initiative roll and gains temporary hit points equal to half your level, which lasts for one minute. If you're curse bound two, when you use this, the bonus increases to plus three. If you're curse bound three, it increases to plus four. You're only going to be multiple levels of curse bound if you've already had a fight and not refocused. In which case, you're suffering the penalties for your class. See, over and over again, I'm like, but compare this to this sorcerer or this cleric or any other caster. Like, how is this better or more interesting? Next new feat, Whispers of Weakness. It's curse bound, one action. Voices whisper to you how to best lay a creature low. You target one creature within 60 feet. If it has any weaknesses, you learn them, as well as which of its saving throw modifiers is lowest. You also come to understand its movements, gaining a plus two status bonus to your next attack roll or skill check made as part of an attack action against that foe before the end of your turn. The target is then temporarily immune for one day. It's worth pointing out that this feat sort of existed before the remaster. It gave you a spell that let you cast this as a focus spell. But now, like, you could use it a couple of times without having to refocus. It doesn't have the flexibility of the focus spell, but it just works a little bit differently. I guess the main thing is just that it's curse bound, so it increases your curse, which is only bad. Next new feat, also curse bound. Level 2 feet, Meddling Futures. It's a free action. You open yourself to the guidance of whatever spirits or powers deign to help you. Roll 1d4 to see what type of spirit is drawn to you. Your next action must be the type of action the spirit prefers, but you also gain the list of benefit for the action as the spirit guides you. Sound like a ancestors? Yeah, there's the ancestors mystery in feet form. If you attempt to use a different action, you must succeed a DC 6 flat check or the action is lost. If you roll a 1 on the d4... Warrior, you must attempt a strike. You gain a plus one status bonus to your attack roll and a plus two status bonus to damage or a plus six status bonus to damage if you are at least curse bound three. So like they took the ancestor's ability to have to act randomly <laughs> but took away like the battle mysteries armor and weapon proficiencies. Like it's just like they're including more garbage that you can choose from. If you roll a two, adept, you must attempt a perception check or a skill action. You gain a plus one status bonus to the check or a plus two status bonus if you are curse bound three. Okay. If you roll a three, sage, you must attempt to cast a spell. You gain a status bonus to the spell's damage or healing equal to the spell's rank or equal to the spell's rank plus three if you are at least curse bound three, which means you have to be 11th level. So it's basically just scaling with a penalty. Number four, Wanderer, you must attempt a stride action or a fly climb or burrow action if you have the relevant speed. You gain a plus 10 foot status bonus to your speed for the action. That's cool. Or a plus 20 foot status bonus if you are at least curse bound three. This ability, yeah, it's a free action. Like, it can easily be used to increase your curse bound level, but I don't know what the point of that is anymore. Certain abilities do gain a better benefit for the oracle if you have a higher curse bound value but that's only those abilities so like this is going to like require specific builds to work well with the way the oracle functions now which requires a higher level of proficiency than they were aiming for by redoing by remastering the oracle okay fourth level new feats Knowledge of Shapes. Free action. Curse bound. Prerequisites. Reach spell or widen spell. Which are feats for the oracle, obviously. Inspiration lets you surpass your preconceptions of your spell's limits. You use reach spell or widen spell as a free action. Definitely beneficial. Definitely useful. Too bad you increased your curse to do it. Next feat. Also level 4. Thousand Visions. Free action. Curse bound. You open your senses to numerous visions of the immediate future. The visions grant you subtle details of your immediate surroundings within 30 feet. 
Within this range, you don't need to succeed at a flat check to target a concealed creature. You're not off guard to creatures that are hidden from you, unless you're off guard to them for reasons other than the hidden condition. And you need only a successful DC 5 flat check to target a hidden creature. Beyond 30 feet, the visions become overwhelmed with too many possible futures, making all of your senses imprecise beyond this range. The visions persist for one minute. It's sort of like taking some benefits and the drawback of the Flames Oracle, Flames Mystery. Okay, this can be useful. It can. Obviously, it's situational, but sometimes it's really nice to have. I think that's the most positive thing I've said about any of the feats. <laughs> Next new oracle feat, Gifted Power, level 6. Your mystery grants you additional magic. You have an extra spell slot of your highest rank, which you can use only to cast one of your mystery's granted spells heightened to this rank. Convenient. I like it. It's just an extra spell slot. Cool. Special. If you have the Divine Access class feature at 11th level, or Mysterious Repertoire feat, you can cast spells that you learned from those abilities using the additional spell slot from Gifted Power. It's a very interesting way to work extra spells in, or extra spell slots in. It's cool. Next feat, Cosmos Oracles, Water Walker, level 8 feet. When in the throes of your curse, your steps take on a supernatural buoyancy. When you are a curse-bound one, you can stride across liquids that don't support your weight, but you must end your movement on a surface that can support you or you fall into the liquid as normal. When you are a curse-bound two or worse, you gain the effects of water walk. But this is for any oracle of any mystery. I mean, it's interesting. It no longer is attached to Cosmos, which is kind of crappy. But it's a good feat. It's useful. Tenth level feats. Roll the Bones of Fate. One action, curse bound. Prerequisites, bones or lore mystery. Frequency, once per ten minutes. You roll a handful of bones to learn, or perhaps influence, the future course of events. Roll 1d4 and use the corresponding result below. Whenever you roll the Bones of Fate, any effects from a previous usage immediately end. When you roll a 1. Good! You or an ally within 30 feet can roll twice on your next attack roll or skill check. Taking the higher result, this is a fortune effect. This is great, if you could just land on one. Two, bad. One creature you are observing within 30 feet must succeed at a will save against your spellcasting DC. On a failure, the target must roll twice on their next attack roll. Or, skill check. That takes at least one action to perform, taking the lower result. This is a misfortune effect. Great. Three, mixed. You gain the benefits of rolling both a one and a two. Awesome. Four, cursed possibilities. Your attempts to meddle in the forces of prophecy bring dire consequences for all. Every creature within 30 feet of you when you perform the augury rolls twice on their next attack roll or skill check that takes at least one action to perform. If the highest number rolled is odd, they take the lower result, and if the highest number rolled is even, they take the higher result. If they took the lower result, this effect has the misfortune trait for them, and if they took the higher result, it has the fortune trait. <laughs> okay, another one of those things that's just random. I don't think I'd take it, because it's not predictable. Sure, you could take it just for fun, but then it's just for fun. I mean, you could pick up an interesting gun, magic item, for fun, and use it, even though you're a caster. I guess if I'm talking about optimization, I wouldn't take it. Otherwise, do what you want. Have fun. Great. Next feat, level 10, the dead walk. Two actions, curse bound. Oh, roll the bones of fate was also curse bound. Next new feat, level 10, the dead walk, two actions, curse bound. Prerequisites, ancestors or battle mystery. You beseech warrior spirits to come forth and aid you. Two ghostly warriors manifest within a 30-foot emanation of you and each attempt to strike against an adjacent enemy using your spell attack modifier and then disappear. The warrior strikes each deal 4d6 spirit damage and your warriors can flank with one another and with you and your allies. If you're curse bound 2 when you use the dead walk, you can send summon 3 warriors. If you're curse bound 3, you can send summon 4 warriors. The warriors disappear at the start of your next turn. This is really nice. Partly because they don't use your multiple attack penalty. And it's curse bound. So you could use it at least twice a day. Then starting 11th level, you can use it three times a day. I mean, three times before refocusing. It's just extra damage. It's cool. It's fun. It's full of flavor. 
It's a decent feat. Next feat, level 10, Trial by Skyfire, one action, curse bound. It also has the fire trait. Prerequisites, Cosmos or Flames Mystery. Your lips murmur as you portend a great disaster, one you hope you survive. A rain of blazing bolts begins to fall from the heavens in a 10-foot emanation centered on you that deals 2d6 fire damage to all creatures in the emanation at the end of each of your turns. Basic reflex save. You can't exclude yourself from the emanation. The sky fire persists for one minute. While you can't dismiss it, you can suppress the effect for one round with a sustain action. The rain of fire is suppressed if you fall unconscious. If you become curse bound three or four at any point during trial by fire, sorry, trial by sky fire's duration, the emanation increases to 15 feet and the damage increases to 46. So this is the upper level of the flames mystery, but you can take it if you're cosmos or flames. I guess it's cool they gave the option. I, I guess it kind of stinks that you have to take a feat to get back what they removed. I just think that's crappy. Like Water Walker, if you're Cosmos, it should just be free. I, I think that stinks. Next new feat, level 10, Waters of Creation. Two actions, and it has the Cursebound Traits and... Divine Healing Oracle Vitality Water. Prerequisites. Life or Tempest Mystery. Water is the source of life, and you draw upon this primordial force to heal your allies' wounds. A gentle ring ripples out from you in a 15-foot emanation, restoring 5d6 hit points to creatures in the area. At 12th level and every two levels thereafter, the amount restored increases by 1d6. If you are curse bound 3 when you use Waters of Creation, the amount healed increases to d8s. Okay. I, I guess you're getting a little bit of the previous life mystery oracles benefit when you have curse bound at high levels. It's just not impressive because I know what they took away. Okay, so in a vacuum, would that be useful? Absolutely. That's definitely useful. There's no reason not to take it, really, because like, you can do it at least twice before you refocus. And you heal an area. That's cool. Next new feat, level 12, Epiphany at the Crossroads. Free action. Divine Oracle, frequency once per day, trigger your turn begins. Requirements, you are unconscious and have the dying condition. The crossroads between life and death is a place that can reveal many secrets. You gain the effects of an augury spell and a strange near-death vision. Empowered by the realization, you then lose the dying condition, becoming wounded one or increasing your wounded value by one as normal, regain a number of hit points equal to twice your level, and can stand. This is awesome! It's fun, full of flavor, and quite useful in combat. It's a really good feat. See, I don't hate everything they did. Next new feat, level 14, Lighter Than Air. Prerequisites, Water Walker. Your mysterious steps become even lighter, transcending the mortal world altogether. When you have the Cursebound condition, you gain the effects of Fly. If you are Cursebound 3 or greater, you gain a plus 10 foot status bonus to your Fly speed. Anyone can take this as long as they took Water Walker. So, like, everyone gets to dip into the Cosmos Oracle's abilities. And if you're Cosmos, you have to spend feats to get this. I just... I think that sucks. Okay, in a vacuum. 14th level. Curse bound. You fly. Yes, that's good. Yes, there's a prerequis prerequisite, but for as long as you're curse bound, so just don't refocus and you can fly. That's quite good. Because there's no limit on it. No duration. That's a very useful feat. Next new feat, level 14 revelations focus, the further extents of your mystery provide an endless wellspring of magic, when you refocus you regain all your focus points instead of one, that's it, it's not impressive, it's just for the remaster that's what it was going to do, it's what it was always going to do next new feat, level 16, conduit of void and vitality, two actions curse bound, prerequisites any oracle mystery, requirements you have heal or harm as a signature spell and an available spell slot to cast it with you use the unstable energy of your curse to manipulate the b the most basic of divine magic. You cast a three-action heal or harm spell, expending the slot as normal. 
If the spell restores hit points to one or more creatures, then one creature healed by the spell regains a number of additional hit points equal to 1d8 times your curse bound value. If the spell damages one or more creatures, then one creature harmed by the spell takes additional damage equal to 1d8 times your curse bound value. This is a lot like, almost exactly like, the higher levels of the life mysteries curse benefit. But you have to take a feed for it at level 16. I just hate that. Okay. Again, judge it in a vacuum. There's nothing wrong with this. You just heal people. You you, you just, just heal people. It's healing. It's good. It's, it's Sure, it's latent levels, but it's useful. It's a very useful feat. And there's no penalty to using it. Okay, you increase your curse bound value. Fine. But you can still do it at this level three times before refocusing. That's a lot of healing. The short version for the Oracle archetype, nothing's changed. But I'll read the rest of it for you, those of you who want to know how it works. And remember that there are also feats that you can take as an Oracle archetype that will help anyone. Like you could, as a commander, take the one that gives you plus two to initiative to everyone and gives everyone temporary hit points. Or you could heal a single target. Like there are a lot of feats that are for the Oracle that are actually quite useful if you're just taking it as an archetype to grab a couple extra feats. Oracle archetype. I don't always do this, but I'm going to read its suggestions for multi-class Oracle characters because it's really short and it's correct. The Oracle Archetype is a great choice for characters who want to use powerful curse-bound abilities that come at a high at a cost. It's especially good for characters looking to add some high-risk, high-reward options. Martial Oracles can use powerful curse-bound abilities to access unique magical effects. Spellcaster Oracles can further flex their diverse pool of options at the cost of a curse. And since you're making your own build, you can just kind of choose whatever curse you want, because you get to choose whatever mystery you want. Whatever fits your build. Oracle Dedication. Level 2 feet. Archetype dedication multiclass. Prerequisites charisma plus 2. Choose a mystery. You become trained in religion and the mystery skill. If you are already trained, you become trained in a skill of your choice. You gain the curse associated with your mystery, which follows the normal rules for an oracular curse. You cast spells like an oracle and gain the cast a spell activity. You gain a spell repertoire with two cantrips. Either common divine cantrips or other divine cantrips you learn or discover. You're trained in the spell attack modifier and spell DC statistics. Your key spell casting attribute for oracle archetype spells is charisma and their divine oracle spells. What you would expect. Level 4 feat. Basic mysteries. You gain a first or second level oracle feat of your choice. I will go over some options for those in a moment. Basic oracle spell casting. Level 4 feat. You gain the basic spellcasting benefits. When you gain a spell slot of a new rank from the Oracle Archetype, add a common divine spell or a, another divine spell you have learned or discovered, including the granted spells associated with your mystery, to your repertoire of that spell rank. This is all really straightforward. Feat 4. First Revelation. You gain your mystery's initial revelation spell. If you don't have one, you gain a focus pool of one focus point. You can refocus by reconciling the conflicting nature of your mystery, which also reduces your curse bound value by one. Feet 6, Advanced Mysteries, you gain an Oracle feat. For meeting its prerequisites, your Oracle level is equal to half your level, like it used to be. Mysterious Breadth, level 8 feat, increase the spell slots you gain from Oracle Archetype feats by 1 for each spell rank other than your two highest spell ranks. Level 12, Expert Oracle Spellcasting, you gain the Expert Spellcasting benefits. It's just you get more spells. Master Oracle Spellcasting at level 18, you gain Master Spellcasting benefits, you get even more spells of higher levels. Now the feats for an archetype really varies. All right, I'm just going to touch on this. For the oracle archetype, foretell harm is probably useless. Okay, technically it doesn't have a, a no use. It does do some damage, but it's not going to be worth a feat for you because it does so little. However, the next three are great choices for the fourth level archetype feat that gives you a first level or second level oracle feat. Nudge the scales that lets you just restore hit points equal to two plus double your level to one creature within 30 feet. Yes, it's curse bound, but so what? You can do it twice. That's the most you can ever do it, by the way, because you don't have the oracle's ability to gain the 11th level class feature of increasing your curse bound value. 
so you can only ever go up to two. But that's the way it's always been. So okay. Still, you can do this twice before refocusing. And you can be a barbarian and heal somebody, including yourself. Cool. Or just give yourself immunity to void damage, because that's a great use for a first level feat. Awesome. And you can still restore your own hit points. It nudge the scales is a great feat. Oracular warning is also a good feat for anyone to take who just wants to have something to help out the party. Probably somebody who doesn't usually help out the party. Like the rogue. <laughs> I don't, I don't know about rogues in your group, but, you know, people that are generally selfish on the selfish side, the character, not the player. Oracular Warning is the one that gives plus two status bonus to each ally's initiative roll when you're about to roll initiative. It's a free action. And they also each gain temporary hit points equal to half your level. All of these are going to be curse bound, but so what? It just means that there's a limit on how many times you can use them before you refocus. The next one that's great is Whispers of Weakness, also a first level feat. One action, curse bound. You target a creature within 60 feet, you learn all of its weaknesses, and which of its saving throw modifiers is lowest. This is great for a melee martial combatant, because you find out if it's best to intimidate them, to demoralize, or if it's best to trip them or grapple them, or whatever, you can choose what to attack them with because you know their weaknesses. Plus, you get plus two in your next attack roll, status bonus. Can you imagine a fighter that's doing this? It's just one action, you can do it twice in a fight? This is really cool. Granted, it's only on each target once because that makes them immune for a day, but damn, that's great. That's a good feat for anybody else. Like, the Oracle feats help everyone else more than Oracles. Okay, fine. So they're here to just give you a toolbox of tools to steal. Do it. That's what they're here for. Meddling futures. Don't take it. It's the one that you roll a d4 to see what you get a bonus for and you have to do it or you have to roll a flat check to avoid losing your action. It's, it's crap. No. So really, for the first, the fourth level feat in the archetype that allows you to get a first or second level spell, it's just those three that I mentioned. Nudge the Scales, Oracular Warning, and Whispers of Weakness, but they are all useful, and they're all good. Okay, honorable mention to Domain Acumen. Because it gives you, a, gives you a domain spell. And some of the domain spells are bullshit. So choose your domains wisely. When you get to the 8th level, sorry, when you get to the 6th level Oracle Archetype feat, I would wait until 8th level to use it. Take Thousand Visions, because occasionally... It is insanely useful. Within 30 feet, you don't need to succeed at a flat check to target a concealed creature. You're not off guard to creatures that are hidden from you, unless you're off guard for them from some other reason than the hidden condition. And you only need a five flat check to target a hidden creature. It's a free action, curse bound. It's great. It can save your life. It can end a fight. It can save your party's life. Thousand Visions is really useful for somebody who is going to be in the thick of combat and fighting things that they need to be able to see to hit. If you get to 12th level and you're still thinking Oracle, Spiritual Sense is quite useful, depending on the GM. For my group, it'd be very useful because you can see ghosts that are inside objects and that might be necessary at some points. It's level six feet, so you have to be 12th level. And I have to say, if you get to 20th level, and you're still thinking you like the Oracle archetype, take the Dead Walk or Waters of Creation, because they're still useful. Mostly Waters of Creation. The Dead Walk isn't all that useful at 20th level. <laughs> but healing is always useful. So Waters of Creation is great. Again, especially if you're a martial type. Anyway, so that's all my thoughts on the Oracle, including the Oracle archetype and the Oracle feats and the Oracle mysteries. Like I said earlier, at my table, I'm not using the new Oracle Mysteries. I think I am actually going to use the new Oracle Feats. But the Oracle Mysteries, there is no reason for me to accept the new book. It's just not as fun. It's not as cool. And it's not as appealing. It's penalties without the benefits and the fun flavor that's backed up by mechanics. That's just my opinion. Anyway, 
Thank you for letting me borrow your eyes and ears. And anger, I guess, maybe. Thank you for listening. And if you're a patron, I'm grateful for you guys being here. I appreciate your help every day, every month that matters. If you want to check Discord to join us and just chat with us, it doesn't have to be related to patrons. I mean, there's the like other links down there, like link to buy the book, link to Patreon, link to buy some cool dice if you want, or just Discord. Just come chat with us because we're nerds and you're in good company. <laughs> And also, if you do join Patreon for $5 or more, we do a monthly drawing for some cool stuff like big dice or dice tray or dice bag. It's dice something because dice. If you want to see the remainder of the videos on this playlist for Player Core 2, here. And if you want to see Howl the Wild playlist, it's here. Thank you again. Bye-bye.